Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to shortly introduce our panel. At my left is Professor Monique Bretteler. She's a director at the German Center for Neurodegenerative Diseases in charge of population health sciences. She's also a adjunct professor at Harvard School for Public Health, Professor Bretteler. Uh, the next member of the panel is Professor Ada Jonat. Firstly, it is again somebody who has received the famous phone call from Stockholm. In 2009, Professor uh, Jonat has, been, has received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry along with Ramakrish, Mr. Ramakrishnan and Mr. Steitz for her studies on the structure and function of the ribosome. Uh, she is now a science director of the Helen Milton Kimmelmann Center for Biomolecular Structure and Assembly of the Weizmann Institute. Uh, then we have Professor Susan Gasser. She is a director of the Friedrich Mischer Institute for Biomedical Research in Basel and also a professor of molecular biology at the University of Basel. And last but not least, you note the gender balance in our panel, Professor Rui Costa, who is an investigator at the Champalimau uh, uh, Foundation in the area of the neuroscience program. He has been recipient of the Marie Curie International Reintegration Grant, so one of these initiatives which brings back researchers from uh, other parts of the world Euro, to Europe to uh, reinverse the brain drain. But he has also been a laureate of uh, ERC grants, as it has already been indicated too. He has received the starting grant and the consolidator grant, and he might be one of our future Nobel Prize winners. So, uh, I would now like to ask to open uh, the presentations of our members of the panel. And the first speaker is uh, Professor Bretteler, who will address those science areas which she considers to be the most promising in order to address the challenges we have heard already throughout today. Monique, please. I think you tried to speak there. Is my mic on? Yeah, now yeah. it is. OK. Thank you very much. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in 100 years from now, you will all be dead. <laughs> and so will I, by the way. These were some of the core lines of a very happy, upbeat tune that was popular when I was in uh, university in the, in the 80s. And at that time, those lines were true. And I think in this audience, they are still true. But that's only because there is hardly any people below the age of 20, right? Otherwise, we should not make that. We have heard that before. People are living lo uh, longer. Life expectancy, let me see how I do this, is increasing and at a dramatically uh, dramatic Pace. You may have seen this kind of figures. This is from the 1800s. It's a linear increase in life expectancy. This occurs across the globe, and it's still ongoing. And the pace at which you can grasp that a little bit, if you think of it, if you work a week, towards the end of your five-day work week, you already have gained almost two days of life expectancy. So basically, you get the weekend for free. <laughs> As we heard from the previous speakers, towards the end of life, disease also increases, the likelihood of developing disease, and especially chronic, age-related, non-communicable diseases. And of course, that is, I think it's a realistic threat. It's also considered as a major challenge for our current societies. And what I will argue in the next 18 or so minutes is that I think that our best approach to really tackle this is to try and prevent those diseases. I will argue that prevention is a very strong approach. I will highlight 
some of the developments in research and, and, and science over the last decades, which I think will be extremely helpful to bring that goal uh, closer. And then I will also point out some issues that I think so, some, some challenges, some caveats that we should bear in mind in moving in that direction. But before I get to that, there's a few concepts, some basic concepts that I would like to point out. The first is that actually prevention, the recipe for prevention is quite simple. We have to identify people who are at risk. We have to know what are the risk factors that can be, uh, that can be modified. We have to modify those, or we have to find ways to modify those risk factors. It can be uh, behavioral intervention, can also be uh, medical interventions, other interventions. And we have to target those interventions towards the people at risk, and voila, success. Health. We are talking about how to keep healthy. What do we mean when we speak about health? Actually, the current official definition of health has been out for more than 50 years. It's the WHO definition of health, which actually emphasizes that health is a state of absence of disease. It's near perfect, but it's a state. This concept in recent years is more and more being challenged by people who say that actually we should rather think of health as an um, ability of a complex system to adapt and to uh, self-manage in the face of not only physical but also societal and emotional challenges. Quite a different notion and I think especially in our current society with new uh, uh, options of technologies, a very interesting uh, change of setting. Another concept, risk. If I say that in 100 years we are all dead, that is a very, uh, well, that's basically a, a prediction that I can do with 100% certainty. But that is because I did not specify the time frame, right? Well, actually there I did specify the time frame. 100 years, I'm fine. If I would say one third of us will develop dementia, that's also true because that is the risk that we are exposed to. Only it is not very informative if I don't give a time frame there, right? Because of course nobody of us wants to develop dementia, but it makes really a difference if that is only in 40 or 50 years or just before you die, or that this is already something that you would face next year, next five years. And that is very important because that brings us to the notion of compression of morbidity. And I think that in the realm of age-related diseases, that is actually what we are heading for. We are not considering total annihilation of diseases like we would want to do with infectious diseases through vaccination or so. With age-related diseases, we actually want to push the onset of disease towards later ages not necessarily thereby reducing the number of people who in the end may suffer from such a disease, but adding healthy life years to those before they develop the disease. Ideally, of course, we would push onset of the disease towards the afterlife, right? Because who cares about getting dementia in heaven or hell? Good, let's move to prevention. Prevention works. And there's actually, and I know that I was asked to, uh, to speak only about the last 10 years, but the last 10 years are based, of course, upon the history before. So we have to go a little bit further back also to get some very important lessons, I think, from prevention research. One is that one need not always understand the causes to prevent the consequences. And a textbook example of this, at least textbook for epidemiologists, is the work of John Snow, who in 1854 effectively managed to contain a cholera outbreak. And this was years before even a fibrio cholera was detected as, or identified, I should say, as the causative agent. What did he do? He painstakingly mapped all the cases of cholera 
in London at that moment tried to do some pattern recognition, basically identified that there was a link to a water pump in Broad Street, convinced the authorities to take the handle of that pump, and the cholera was contained. That was a non-medical, non-direct medical intervention. Actually, we have seen a lot of those non-medical interventions, especially also in the last century, that have had a large impact on health by preventing diseases. And this slide just summarizes some of the major ones there. Better, better diets, better sanitation. Actually, that the uh, new uh, premier of India uh, a couple of weeks ago argued that he wants more toilets in India. I think that is a very, very wise move to improve health across the country. Uh, legislation that we have to wear seat belts, helmets, etc. The smoking ban was already mentioned uh, by one of the previous speakers, but of course also vaccinations and the recognition that, for example, hypertension is an extremely important risk factor for cardiovascular diseases with the subsequent development of effective treatments. Actually, I may come back to this later on, that it's interesting that hypertension in itself, of course, is not a disease, right? But it was very helpful to define it as a disease to prevent later diseases, because suddenly we could develop medication and sell medication. The, there was an incentive for pharma, and actually it's a big, big market. What other lesson is there regarding prevention to take? One, well, that multi-causal diseases, and most age-related diseases are multi-causal, actually offer also multiple options for intervention. And an example from my own research field is uh, dementia research. This is the typical picture, increasing incidence of dementia with age. It's commonly considered that Alzheimer's disease is the most important uh, cause of uh, dementia with uh, accumulation of plaques and tangles in the brain of those participants, uh, sorry, people, patients, considered mostly um, some 60% uh, explained by Alzheimer's disease. Actually, a lot of research over the last decades, and I cannot go into that, has pr uh, shown that this model is far too simplistic, that actually Alzheimer's disease, especially when it occurs at later ages, is a complex disorder. This is nicely illustrated here, and I don't know whether you can read it in the back, but this is a study comparing people who died with dementia and people who died without dementia. And you see here that in the people who died with dementia, actually only one-third had full-blown Alzheimer pathology in their brains as the only present pathology. The majority of demented people had a lot of mixed pathologies, vascular pathology being the most important of those. And so if you think of not targeting amyloid or tangles. Actually, people have been trying to target those for 20 years or more, and so far without much success. This is where most of the uh, Alzheimer's trials uh, focused on. But this idea of that there is also other pathology, vascular pathology, and given that in recent decades we actually have seen a decrease, there's a trend of a decrease in the incidence of vascular pathology then one could think maybe we can also effectively do something about dementia by intervening on vascular disease risk. And actually, indeed, in uh, recent years, there have been several studies now, uh, some study that I did in the Netherlands, but also studies from the UK, from uh, the US, from Sweden, that show that the age-specific incidence of dementia has been declining very much following the pattern that we have seen with cardiovascular diseases. Okay, but I should not get carried away about uh, dementia research. Let's focus on what are some of the recent insights, achievements, and developments that I think are important for prevention research and preventative interventions in the decades to come. Well, the first is that over the last decade, there has been an enormous emergence of systems biology. With the uh, coding of the human genome, there was, of course, a lot of omics research 
following. We now look at the transcriptome, the proteome, the metabolome, generating lots and lots and lots uh, of data to actually understand the complex systems that human beings are. And not only those, uh, actually we also should look at the complex of factors outside of us, exposome or the, uh, um, how is it also called? I think the environmentome, or I don't know what, everybody makes words up with ohm in the end, but basically stating this whole complex of external factors, including pollu uh, pollution, but also behavior. The microbiome, very interesting research coming up recently. There are a lot, we, we are not alone in our body, right? There is a lot of worlds and, 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 and yeah, universes in us. It's if you think of the number of microorganisms living in and on us, it's scary. They outnumber the number of cells in our body by a factor of 10. They do have an influence also in maybe expressing the genome. And then, of course, there's also the social networks, even outside, all influencing how people function in health and behavior. Imaging technologies, it has already been mentioned, we can now look at the human body and its organs and its function at a scale in a detail that was unthought of uh, even 10 years ago. Extremely important, of course, if we want to identify early changes in structure and function even before people have any symptoms of disease. This is our way to start and identifying people at risk. And then the tools. We have terrific toolkits now. Actually, the science fiction of the past is already our toolkit for the future. I don't know how many of you recognize here these uh, movies, but yes, we already have uh, mm, brain, uh, uh, brain machine interfaces, right? We have the nanobots that we sent off in our bloodstream for target drug delivery or even uh, cellular repair. Uh, we have actually this, um, uh, what is it, what is the word again? This quantified self where they were so good at that Star Trek, that is basically what people can do now. Even Dracula was right because there's research showing that the filtering out of senescent cells or bringing in the blood of young animals actually may increase life expectancy in younger people. Not to talk about Frankenstein, we can put whatever organ in a body. This week we heard about a, a successful transplantation of a uterus, but we can also grow new organs, right, from uh, uh, stem cells. So there is an enormous amount of possibilities that we can bring to the future that we can use to work on prevention. But there are a few caveats, challenges, and conditions. One very important caveat, especially in this area of big, big data, is the notion that the most overrated quality of data is their existence. The fact that there are data and that there are big data and that there are even bigger data does not mean that they are good data, high quality data, informative data. As an epidemiologist, epidemiologists have spent 150 years thinking about study design, how to capture relevance uh, experience. This is something that is easily uh, being lost in current big data hype. Another important thing, there is no heroism in prevention. We may talk about prevention, but it's not so clear who is going to gain from that. Definitely not the doctors, because they don't have any grateful patients. Why would the patient be grateful, right? They were not even sick in the beginning. There's also no clear gain for industry. That may change a little bit now with the better monitoring, with this uh, more diagnostics, with uh, lifestyle interventions, uh, tracking, etc. But until recently, actually Big Pharma, for example, they were not really helped by the FDA or EMA to invest in prevention. Hypertension being the, the exception, as I mentioned, but that was because they managed to make that a disease. 
Also for governments, it's not that clear what the gain is. They have to do this upfront investment in big prevention interventions, but how to qualify, how to quantify the economic benefit at the end. And even for the, I should not say patients, they are not yet patients, the people themselves, it's not that clear. And that has to do with this prevention paradox, that if you talk about prevention, you typically talk about people who have actually by themselves a small risk. And it's those people with a small risk who typically give rise to most of the cases. Much more cases than the ones at high risk. And related to that, but a slightly different concept, is also that a preventive measure that brings large benefits to a community as a whole may actually bring very little benefit to the individual. Thousands of people have to wear their seat belts to prevent one, uh, one traffic-related injury. And then my final point, and this is also something that was mentioned before, I think that what we really need to make progress is translational research but, and interdisciplinary research. Translational research, current buzzword, very often conceived as just a translation from, translation from basic science to the drugs market, right? From bench to bedside make the money, whereas actually translation is basically bringing insights from one field to another, so that can also go back, and it can also go across disciplines. It need not be in the biomedical field contained. If we want to have an impact on society, why not bring in the social scientist? The problem is that, and this is regardless of what the commissioner said before, that there is now all these programs, I think that still there is very, very little incentives to do truly interdisciplinary research. The papers don't get published because all the journals, the top-notch journals, are high uh, specialty journals. There's no good grants to do really translational or interdisciplinary research because there are no interdisciplinary teams to even evaluate that research. There is very much siloing of knowledge, knowledge development, and knowledge application in our societies. And I think this is really a big challenge that we somehow have to overcome, not only by small talk that we want to change that, but actually also by really putting big bucks there to make, uh, if we want to make a real contribution and move the field forward. And that brings me, I think, yeah, to my summary and conclusions. Just a nice blue tile plate of some of the issues that I mentioned before. I will not repeat all these, but my core message is that I am a strong believer in prevention. It works. I think we have great tools, and we only got better tools in the last 10 years, so let's work on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monique, for this excellent presentation and set out of the tools of in and instruments which are in our possession to improve our healthy life. Now, it raises many questions because evidently you favor prevention, it seems, uh, over new technologies at any price. It raises the question of the role of state and public authorities compared to private initiatives, social innovation, to address lively, uh, healthy lifestyles. But I would now like to ask Ada Jonat whether she wants to react to the presentation of uh, Monique, and in particular to set out what in her area of research she thinks we can expect to improve uh, the health of our mankind. So I don't have to focus on the last 10 years? You, <laughs> you, you indicated that you might start a little bit earlier too. Okay, but uh, let, me, let me go back to the 10 years and then I go, then I react. 10 years ago, a new antibiotic came into use, which made me, from very sad face, some smiley. Uh, there is already resistance to this new antibiotic, and also some of the hopes were not uh, 
did not come out. And I think that one of the reasons, there are many reasons, one of the reasons is that bacteria want to live. They can change themselves very quickly, much, much quicker than our mind can follow. They were on the planet before us, much before us. They are here with us. The pessimists say that they will be after us. Bacteria want to live, and our tools to control this uh, resistance, I'll talk about it in a minute, are somewhat limited. And they are, one of the reasons is that there was very little basic research concerning uh, bacteria and resistance. And here I must not fight with you, but uh, talk for, for basic research. About the middle of the last, in, in the middle of the last century, a little bit earlier, let's say in the 30s, DNA was hardly known. There was DNA. It was clear that it has the genes. The genes are the instructions how to, to make the cell workers, which are proteins, but that this is what was known. And there was a lot, a lot of uh, basic research to understand how DNA is built. Today, kids know what is DNA. You know when I ask a kid, I ask kids, many kids, seven, eight years old, what is DNA, do you know? Yeah, of course, this is the tool that the police uses to identify criminals. <laughs> so, so even kids understand that there is something between the, the, the person or the personality and the genes. When, when the work on the, on the structure of, of DNA was carried on and for years, and in several very fantastic distinguished institutions like Cambridge, like uh, UCLA, like Stanford, Nobody expected what will come out of it. Complete, complete uh, change, complete new uh, science, life sciences, everything. We heard in the, in, in, earlier from the commissioner about treatment of breast cancer. Wouldn't be able without DNA. And I, I really don't have to talk now here, and I don't want to say how much DNA uh, contributed to our healthy life or to understanding why we are not healthy. But without this uh, basic science, we wouldn't be able to do it. DNA is the, is the instruction, um, I don't know, the instruction part of life, the genes. How do, do the genes become proteins, what is the translation, but not your type of translation, the translation in science from instructions to proteins was known only basically, but not in, in a, um, detail about uh, 30 years ago. The component, the cellular component that makes the translation is called ribosome. It was not clear how it works. When uh, we started, and I don't want to go through all, it was not assumed or not expected to give results. Not only we got results, we also understood, this is just a bonus, unexpected bonus, we also now are understanding how half of the useful antibiotics work, and also how resistance can happen just by doing basic research of translation of the genetic code. Actually, now we come to the last 10 years, the structures of the ribosome and of their complexes with antibiotics came out 14 years ago, uh, in 2000, yeah, it's 14 years ago, more or less. Within three or four more years, all the, all the antibiotics that they target ribosomes, so almost all of them, 90% of them were understood, were mapped, became completely clear. Also, it became completely clear why and how resistance happens. Uh, as I said, 10 years ago, there was a new antibiotic. 
but there was not much uh, research on antibiotic development. The companies were, were not very interested in doing it because of the bad ratios of high cost versus benefit and risk versus benefit. And the idea that no matter what they do, there will be resistance. And this held back the companies and held back the antibiotics all over the world. And the numbers during the last 10 years became horrible. For instance, 2 million, 2 million patients annually in the United States fell ill in infections, in infectious diseases that antibiotics could in principle a recover from, but resistance did not let it always. For instance, 25,000 EC citizens died because of resistance in each year during the last 10 years. Um, there is, for instance, a, another uh, specific uh, example. MERSA, MERSA is the multi-resistance multi, um, strain of staph aureus. That, that is just a, a bacteria, a antibiotic to, to, to deal skin problems. It deals with other things too, but mainly with skin. 150,000 150, cases are reported annually in Europe. It's it just incredible. And companies still were more interested in making products, making med medications, therapeutics, for elderly uh, diseases, because these are steady, very good profit, and it grows each year. Instead of producing antibiotics that are cheap, and uh, may, not may, surely, there will be resistance to them. And I could be as, as uh, pessimistic as I am now, if I had to give this talk or this comment three or four years ago, I, I was uh, really super pessimistic about it. But now I am partially optimistic because there was some type of uh, change in, uh, at least in understanding the problem. About three or four years ago, and I, I take it all together, um, the, the newspapers and the policy makers and the governments started to talk about it and started to say that resistance is, is the worst and that they, one has to, to look into it. For instance, the, the European communities established a new research line for resistance. I know that they did it. I don't know how much money is there. I didn't discover it yet, but they asked us to give them a a photo for the poster, so it goes. Uh, I know that the, the G8 came into the, into the game. The G8 is mainly Europeans, and they also uh, started the program. The American government uh, has a 10 new, 10 new antibiotics to the year 2020, and it's not only the government, it's the companies that, uh, uh, the big pharma companies that joined, Obama created the, what he called the National Task Force for, for uh, Antibiotics. So maybe if you invite me in four years from now or five years from now, there will be some, some positive progress. One pro positive progress we heard also already from the com Commissioner Quinn. She told something that I didn't know about, a new antibiotic that is now being developed in Europe. I know about another one in European co company that I think they still want to keep it uh, quiet, but I know that they, it, it is make, being made and it works. So anyway, in order to, to tell what happened 10 years ago and today, I think that I covered it from, from the DNA, that uh, you will uh, agree with me that basic science is important. And may I? Comment about your first slide. Can we have it? It's going. It's to, to, can we have her, her first slide? 
Okay, so I, I understand that nobody thinks that I want to show or see the first slide. In the first slide, there was a, a graph going up with life expectancy, correct? Of men and women and all goes up. But if you look at it very carefully, you see that there is somewhat flattening in 1960. 1950, or the middle of last century, was the time that antibiotics came into clinics. Ten years later, there was already resistance. So there is a slope going up because life is becoming better, and hygiene is better, and many other factors. But uh, it could be even better than, or even f growing up faster, if there was not this slowing down because of resistance. So if you remember it, or if you can look at it, that's what, what, this is what happened. And I hope for the future that we will learn, if not to eliminate resistance, at least to, to live with it, to, to control it, to, to make it more uh, handable for us, for the health of the world. Thank you. Ada, thank you very much for your uh, scenario, which at the end is not as dark as it is initially sounded. Uh, clear recognition of the need of basic research, but it also clearly shows the necessity and role of public authorities to intervene in research to overcome market failures, because industry not always necessarily invests sufficiently in research and innovation, and therefore the role of the different public levels, be it European or national, to fund in research and innovation. Now, Suzanne, <clears throat> when it comes to the different tools to have a safer or a healthier life in the future, prevention, but there are also these new instruments and tools, and I think one which is everybody talking about is individualized medicine, personalized medicine, and uh, Monique has already talked about big data but big data is not everything. And in that respect, I just came across an article in New York Times which titles, Genetic Tests Offer More Data But Add to Confusion. And the conclusion is that patients are not getting closure. They are walking out not knowing what to make of it, of all these data analyses indicating that mutations have occurred, but at the end they do not know. So how do you see in your area of research the, the possibilities to have healthier life using these kind of, of uh, tools and instruments? So, um, so obviously um, just knowing a sequence or knowing your genetic <clears throat> flaws uh, is not going to cure yourself. And, and, and actually I think uh, what we, it just actually harkens to the, the point that we need more research to understand the correlation between genetic diversity of different humans or, and, um, and disease. But I think uh, the important point is that we do have the tools. Um, medicine is right now at a, at a crossroads where um, it, it can blossom dramatically in the coming years. <clears throat> Uh, to the point that we will be able to predict or, um, outcomes of disease. We're going to, of course, what was mentioned before, be able to use targeted medications rather than general medications. And this saves cost, but it also saves a lot of suffering, a lot of misuse of, of um, treatments, particularly in cancer. So um, I think the, the, the instance where targeted medicine has been the most fruitful so far um, has actually been in cancer treatments and there um, being able to know if uh, what the mutations are in the particular cancer is crucial for targeted treatments. This is a small corner of personalized medicine, but it's one that is actual and uh, is already used. So it's not true that we understand every mutation that can occur in cancer and every effect, but there are now more than 30,000 cancers, different cancers, uh, completely sequenced, and analysis of the mutations uh, allows for a, a very targeted use uh, and 
targeted development of, um, of medication. So that's one thing. The other, the other is uh, something where prevention will, will never actually um, solve it. I mean, prevention is wonderful for lifestyle diseases and, and definitely probably a lot of heart disease and, and obesity, perhaps diabetes type two can be prevented if, if people actually behave, which is unlikely. So uh, I, I think we, you know, we really do, if, if lifestyle diseases were totally pre, pre, um, preventable, um, we, we wouldn't have the incidents that we, the growing incidents that we actually have. But, um, so, so in addition to um, cancer, which is a genetic disease, there are actually a large number of what we call rare diseases, which are, people are usually born with, with a genetic predisposition for uh, failure. Often it's a degenerative failure, and often it reflects other diseases that occur later in life um, through natural mutation or natural degeneration of our tissues. And, and what this, what's the, the technique besides DNA sequencing that is so powerful for medicine nowadays is um, taking differentiated cells from a patient and then allowing them to de-differentiate into a pluripotent stem cell and then re-differentiate them into small organoids in culture dishes. And this works fabulously for a number of organs, not, not to use it to treat the disease, but to understand what a genetic mutation means in the context of an organ or a tissue. So here, uh, fundamental research will be crucial for understanding what a particular mutation in a particular gene, or whether you're born with it or you acquire it, what it means, for example, for retina, what it means, retina differentiation in vitro is extremely uh, efficient. What it means for intestine, intestine differentiation in vitro is extremely efficient. Muscle cells, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think the tools are there. Um, we, we can sequence genomes. We can compare genomes across species and across individuals. We can de-differentiate, re-differentiate, and work on actual human organoids or human um, tissues to know how they will respond to treatments. And finally, we can use these tools to develop targeted medications that I think will um, fill in when prevention doesn't. So I think we're, we're really at an exciting time for medicine, and uh, I, I think we will live healthier. It'll take a while, but we, we will live much longer and much healthier. Thank you, Suzanne. So we need prevention, prevention, but certainly also new technologies, new research. Louis, do you share this uh, uh, approach? So <clears throat> yes, I, I do share the, the the approach that we need more more knowledge. Basically, I think in the field of neuroscience, which is the field that I work in, a lot of the progress in the last ten years came from knowing knowledge, from trying and from combining technology and biology, right? So it came from putting things together. And I mean, there are many examples from stimulating the brain, uh, invasively or not invasively, to things that are more visible, for example, in the retina, prevent, uh, preventing some diseases, protecting the retina, actually fixing it as it's being done at uh, MI, uh, FMI, rewiring it, or as our president of the FCT actually did in his other life, putting genes to, to make it happen. This, I mean, it's, it's nervous tissue. Uh, it's, it, it was unheard of. But I think I would like to deviate a bit here for, I think we, we I feel we miss still two fundamental things. One is understanding human biology for real. So we talk a lot about translation, which means we don't understand. We go from one language to the other and from one technology to the other. But really doing, understanding. I, I, I'm very interested in aging, as many of you are. As a society, 
problem even. And we don't know what normal aging is. I would argue with the majority of you, we don't know what normal memory decline is. I mean, we have an idea. We don't have the, the hypertension studies for normal aging, right? So we don't know a lot of our normal biology. And we need to invest in that. I mean, in many organisms, but including in the human organism. It's not only about translation, it's knowing. Like, what is normal? We don't even know many times. We just translate the disease state. And the other thing is, when we talk about prevention, there's something implied there, which is the ability to predict. So somehow, and I think predictive medicine is somewhat more interesting. I mean, without knowing the cause, it's true. We didn't know the organism in that particular cholera case, but the predictive model happened in the mind of that physician. So, of course, it helps prevent if we can uh, predict, but it also helps choose things, and sometimes choose when not to intervene. Right? We, we don't even know. I mean, we get desperate. If I now get a disease, I try to get everything I can, but maybe many things are just out of desperation. And I truly believe, as a society, we won't be able to afford health systems as they are now. I mean, I, I don't think health will be, in the future, only about hospitals or national health systems or uh, you know, private insurance companies. We need to wear our health, right? So we need to have technology that goes home with us, that helps us eat better, monitors our daily activities, but monitors things like heart rate. Why not things in the blood, right, that we have? We can't afford to have just people. And I will take it even further to education and, and the social sciences. I mean, a lot of things when we talk about prevention, um, would be when, you know, how do you, some of the, some of the things you, you uh, prevention implies you not interacting with another human being. So if we don't understand how the brain makes decisions, right, basic decisions, how can we argue that we can then help that person just by giving them information, say, I'm going to say tobacco is bad and everyone's going to stop, right? We need to understand what makes us tick. And if we understand how we make decisions, we can actually be more influential. So I would make a big argument for understanding the normal human being with all the technology and interact, not so much in the translational sense, but for real, right? We want to know. And, and in prediction, with technology, with education, but predictive models of medicine. That's what I would, if I would have two things, two wishes for the next 10 years, would be that. Thank you very much, <laughs> Rui. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the recommendations of the panel, how you might keep healthy in the future. The first thing, and I think there is broad agreement, behave responsibly. Not, not too much alcohol, no electronic cigarettes or whatever. No sugary drinks. So one certainly conclusion is to behave responsibly, in particular to prevent lifestyle diseases. But on the other hand, I think there was a clear conclusion that we still need a lot of basic research to understand all the differences, the dis diseases and challenges. And it will still take some time to translate these new uh, uh, instruments and tools uh, to our hospitals and doctors. Now, do you want to come in? Do you have questions to the panel? Please, if you just indicate your name and your organization, yes. Um, my name is Alexandro. I'm a computer geek, so uh, mostly I'm not uh, you know, focusing on health. But actually, I have a question for Monique, for the first speaker. You know, many other sciences had already had breakthroughs, like computer science, like electronics in the last few, few years or a few decades. Did medicine have breakthroughs in the last few years, or will, when there will be a breakthrough in medicine or medical science? For example, maybe computers are a breakthrough in medicine and medic. 
I think there is non-stop breakthroughs in medicine. The, the, the big thing is that we can hardly uh, keep track of all the breakthroughs. And I think that actually some of what may seem uh, discrepancies between what we argue here is actually that it's so much all the, at least from my perspective, visions that we uh, yeah, uh, 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 state here are not mutually exclusive. They are all very complementary, and I, I, I don't know, I think if we would uh, get started, we could uh, start uh, taking turns in uh, listing breakthroughs, and there is no end to it. But <laughs> maybe. The biggest breakthrough is to have a molecular understanding of disease, because um, medicine used to be, uh, in, in fact, a, um, an art of diagnostic based on symptoms. And, and then it was known that certain chemicals or certain treatments would eliminate the symptoms. And the big breakthrough has come from understanding the biochemistry of human functions and the, and the genetics behind that. And, and by, by, I mean, it's an enormous breakthrough to say that you understand the molecular basis of disease. This has never been the case, uh, except in the case of infections. And I mean, when it was then bacterial and viruses. And, and so now by saying we, we know what is defective in this disease or that disease, and then doing a targeted treatment, this is absolutely a breakthrough that is uh, earth-shaking. The problem is it's expensive. And, and, and in, in that, and, and, uh, and it will, since we don't understand all the complexity of, of any human being, nor the interaction of various mutations. Each of us has thousands of mutations that render us different from our neighbor. And different combinations are gonna make us react differently to drugs, even though we may know what might be the cause of a particular disease. So uh, it, it's not a, a finished process. It's, it's not, you know, you can say this, but I, I would say human genome was a breakthrough unlike anything. And, and second is um, all this in vitro uh, manipulation, targeted mutagenesis. We now can make a specific mutation in a specific human gene where we want it, not for therapeutic uses, but to understand then what it means in the context of an organoid or, or in vitro in, or in a culture. And then we can optimize treatment. So we're not talking about the science fiction of, of manipulating human genomes, but we're talking about understanding how naturally occurring defects or variations in humans affect disease. And that, to me, is an enormous breakthrough. Thank you, Susan. Are there other, okay. other, other, please, if you want to react. But it is not working. I think it's working. You have, but this one you have here. If I just can add to, to what Susan said so cleverly now, uh, understanding is the breakthrough, but there is a big difference between breakthroughs in high, in high tech, in computers, than in, in medicine or in uh, biology. Once there is a break, what you call breakthrough in high tech, everybody can play. Even kids can, can have a, a little iPhone and whatever, and play, play electronic games. Medicine is not so simple. Although the breakthrough is at least as high, maybe even higher, it stays in the hands of the scientists and, and uh, physicians. And it's not so clear. So thank you for telling it, well, what's going on. If I may say, just, just in the red, yeah, what I was talking about. And I mean, I chose specifically something that people don't, you know, I could talk about things closer to me, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, but just in the retina. We now can, using things against uh, or drugs for VEGF to prevent some types of, of disease, we can put proteins from algae in blind eyes and making them see again because they respond to light. We can put genes that are missing back. These are all huge breakthroughs, right? But they are for, thankfully, only a part of the population that leaves them intensely. 
gland, as, as we say. And this is in a small piece of tissue in our body that is so essential for, for our life. But I mean, I could, I mean we could all name uh, many. Maybe we're bad at PR. <laughs> I propose we take a last question or remark from the public, if there is any. If not, I would propose to close our panel and thank our panelists from the bottom of my heart. I think it has been a very instructive discussion, also optimistic discussion in the sense that research progress in the health area will continue and will at the end deliver towards healthier life and better well-being. Thank you very much for your attention. So, we have time.